Welcome to Flipping Dreams Podcast with your host, Heather Renee May. Each week, we bring you interviews and resources that will inspire you and encourage you. It's never too late to transform your past and empower your future. You are listening to Flipping Dreams. Welcome back to Flipping Dreams. I'm your host, Heather Renee May. And in this episode, we may go to Coney Island. We may end up talking about circus characters, little people of vaudeville, uh, flamethrowers, burlesque. I have no idea because I'm going to be talking to Jim Moore of Vaudevisuals and uh, get to learn a little bit more about Jim's journey in the variety arts, as well as hear about his newly published book that he actually published himself. um, And we get to hear a bit about that journey as well. Um, Jim is a photographer and a performer. He was a mime and in New York City, and he also captured and documented many of his colleagues along the way over the last 30 years. Um, you will see some of his photography on Man on the Wire in the film, uh, the Oscar-winning film of 2009, and as well as he's had a Best Silent Film at Coney Island Film Festival, also in 2009. So um, the great part about this is Jim is a good friend, so I'm really excited to have him on the show, and we will meet him shortly, so stay tuned. You are listening to Flipping Dreams. Hi, Heather. Hey, Jim. That's good to see you. It's and so good to see you. Congratulations on your, on your wonderful series you're doing. It's well, really. Thank I'm very you. impressed. I'm very impressed. I, you know, I mean, people put their mind to things like like you, for example. It's you do it. You do it right. It's really nice. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. honestly, I am so glad you reached out because I was like, oh, this like. To finally be able to talk to you about what you do, I mean, okay, so for listeners, I am very good friends with Jim and his wife, Deborah. Deborah and I are both former dancers. Um, we also play Cajun fiddle. We hang out. Um, we I got to hang out with them this year in Asheville. Um, and so, like, anyway, this is this is great. Uh, you know, you kind of sometimes you forget when you're really good friends with people, and you're like, oh yeah, you have these other lives. And, <laughs> and the- <laughs> Well, it's, it's that you're, you're more friends with Deborah, so you spend more time chatting with her than with me. So it's, it's probably nice, true. Nice it's change of pace to talk to somebody that's the spouse of someone you care for, you know? Yeah, exactly. Nothing personal, but yeah, usually Deborah and I end up doing all the chatting. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing personal. I don't take it. I don't take it bad, you know. <laughs> but 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 it's interesting. So um, Jim and Deborah live in Brooklyn, and um, I will I'll, when I go to visit. It's been a, over a year since I visited last time, but um, I will go visit. And usually Jim is grabbing his his camera and he's running away from us <laughs> to go to town somewhere to film some show. Um, and so, like, Jim, I would love for you to share with listeners a little bit about your background in performing and just mime and all of those things. I want, yes, please, tell me. So, yeah, so I, I was thinking about how to... Um organize this uh, little chat um, and I used to I used to perform in the streets uh, of New York as a mime a, a white-faced mime like Marceau Marceau I passed a hat I did that for like 15 years uh, uh, late 80s I'm sorry late 70s into the early 80s I was performing in New York City and Brussels and Paris Amsterdam St. Louis Houston, New Orleans, it was, I was just having such a great time performing all over the world and passing my hat and meeting so many amazing people. So that was the beginning of my kind of mime career. And I also, at the time, got a lot of um, um, residencies at universities and high schools, teaching students about the art of mime and how silent communication is very valid and and, uh, underplayed in a lot of ways in society because people don't realize that gesture speaks much louder than words does. So that's one of the things that I taught in the school, uh, both colleges and and elementary schools and high schools. So then I I moved on um, kind of after 15 years of performing in the streets and working in the universities. I, um, I was always photographing my peers 
my fellow street performers and all the people that I knew, I always had my camera with me and I always took pictures of them. So um, one day I was just sitting around my apartment and I noticed I had like, you know, boxes and boxes of negatives of stuff that I had shot, which I really hadn't done anything with at that point. So I said, let me, let me put together some like little exhibit or something. So I put together an exhibit and uh, it, it, it was shown at Lincoln Central Library for the Performing Arts. It was like 15 years of my work. It was a really stunning exhibit, all 16 by 20 prints, very beautiful. Francis Broon, you know, Marcel Marceau, all these, George Carl, just a lot of great physical comedians and, and, and variety of performers uh, that I had photographed over the years. So that kind of led me into becoming more of a photographer. My body was getting tired from <laughs> performing in the streets. So this seemed to be like a good uh, opportunity and I really enjoyed photography. So I got into doing photography of the performing arts and it got to a point where I said, well, what is it that I photograph? What is it, uh, the topic of, of what it is that I do? So I, I came up with a kind of a token keyword, which is eccentric performing arts which is like anything other than regular acting, a variety act, a circus, a sideshow, you know, uh, mime. This includes like burlesque, like all of well, that. I don't photograph that. burlesque actually. You know, burlesque oh. is a, a whole different oh, genre. Okay. I mean, see, yeah. See, see, I, see <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I don't know. want to photograph burlesque, but I never, and there were, there were some people in New York that actually had the corner on that. They really, that was their, they, yeah. I call myself an eccentric performing artist photographer, and they call themselves a burlesque photographer. So I didn't want to get involved in that. And I really enjoyed photographing people that were just moving around and playing and having fun and um, not being seductive. Anyway, so nice. yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, what yeah. That, and then, and then, then so I, I photographed for many years, and I, then I started a blog. And uh, in 11 years ago, I started a blog and said, well, this is a good place to put my work that I'm shooting now. It's called Board Visuals, like Vaudeville, Vaudevisuals.com. And uh, I've been posting for 11 years now on the blog. Uh, pictures, videos, interviews, book reviews, all kinds of fun stuff. Really, really fun stuff. Um, so are these, these are, um, some of these blog posts are like historical, but some are also like current, like, well, at least when New York was open and people were performing, you would actually go and capture and then, and then update your blog. Correct. Yes. So in other words, when I was running out of the house when you were visiting Deborah, I was off <laughs> to shoot one of those shows, one of those I, shows downtown and uh, at the Slipper Room or Dixon Place or La Mama or one of the downtown venues that had some really exciting shows going on. Yeah. That's so yeah cool. That got posted to the blog and it's all there. Yeah. And now and, and then COVID and then COVID happened, right? Right. And right. That was like you know, I, I'm sitting around here twiddling my thumbs, deciding what I'm going to do with myself. I could do like, you know, a million self portraits, but Jim, Jim doesn't stay still very long. He's I, I not don't, someone don't. to sit still. So, yeah, <laughs> I can't sit still. I can't. <laughs> and even after all these years of being on the planet, I still I'm still moving around anyway. So I thought to myself, what, am, what can I do to um, to keep myself occupied? And I, I decided to start a little publishing company. I really enjoy books. I have lots and lots of books. I really love books. I think books are really the key to uh, understanding the world. And I, I read all the time. In fact, I'm taking a class online right now in historical nonfiction taught by the University of Virginia. It's amazing. It's so brilliant. I mean, I and this is about on like how to write historical nonfiction? No, no. It's, or... it's kind of like a survey of all the historical nonfiction Ooh. books that have been written in the last, since, since the 18th century. Oh, that would be really fascinating. It's really cool. That would be so, really fascinating. I mean, I read a couple of excerpts from some of the books that they've been featuring, and I'm like, wow, it's really beautiful writing, really beautiful writing. Anyway. There so, are so many books to read. I mean, that's just it. It's like, uh, I, yes, love it. I love it. it and it, write. And write, and, and it's true. Yeah, so... Uh, Books and I, I just so so before. So wait, 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 wait. Hang on. So you started yeah. the press before you wrote the book, or did you write the book and then? Well, let me step back one. Yeah. Okay. So so before I started Void Visuals Press, something happened. Um, I was actually photographing a clown friend of mine who was very successful. He was performing all over the world. He invited me to Paris. I photographed him in Paris. He invited me to St. Louis. I photographed him in St. Louis. He performed at the Big Apple Circus in New York City. I photographed him in all these venues, these three different venues. And then 
before, I mean, when I first shot him in New York, it was the first place I shot him. And, then, and he said, why don't you come to St. Louis and photograph me in St. Louis? I go, oh, okay. And then he hired me in, to go to Paris and photograph him in Paris. So while we were in St. Louis, he said, why don't we do a book together? A Clown in Our Town. I'm like, what a beautiful idea. I'll just follow you on tour wherever you go and take pictures of you with iconic geographic, you know, things. And we'll make a really fun book of your character visiting all these exciting, exotic places. And he said, yeah, that's it. That's the idea. So we started the book, A Clown in Our Town. We had three cities. And then in 2019, at the age of 44, Rob died. Oh, no. He died. Oh, no. Yeah, in a plane on his way to a gig. Anyway, so oh, that so kind sorry. of made me, yeah, crazy. And I'm like, you know, okay, what happened to the project we were working on? I decided that, you know what, we need to do it anyway. I'll make it a tribute book. Oh, and yes. I contacted a bunch of other photographers that had photographed him and got all their pictures and got a bunch of friends to donate a bunch of pictures. I got some, some dignitaries in the circus world to write some beautiful essays about Rob's work, because he was a brilliant performer. He, was, he just brought so much joy to millions and millions of people. And it, was, it, was, it, just, it just destroyed me when he left. But anyway, so, so we did the book anyway. I did, I did the book, I, did, I produced the book, and I did it as a, uh, started a GoFundMe campaign for the book. And I said, if you donate X amount of dollars, you'll get a copy of the book. And all over the world, people donated money to pay for the publishing of this book. It was amazing. From Australia, from New Zealand, from Paris, from you name it, Rob had been there performing and made so many friends and they all loved him so much that they wanted to recollect about his, his beautiful life and his beautiful work. Mm -hmm. So I did this book, this is it here. Oh my gosh, I love that cover. So uh, for course, listeners, yeah. this bright red. Isn't that fun? Clown in that, our was his, that was his kind of iconic suitcase, okay? Oh. There's a wonderful story in the book about that suitcase uh, from another performer that was friends of his, and it's 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 a beautiful book. It's you know, all color and just you know. Oh, gorgeous, it's, look gorgeous. at all this gorgeous. Pictures. So we did we did the first um, the first section of the book is basically the book that Rob and I were working on, which is a clown in our town. So it's got St. Louis, it's got Paris, it's got New York, and then the next and then the next section of the book is photographs by the other photographers which are really beautiful and from Seattle and Texas and all over the place. And then the third section is kind of like friends pictures, just like, you know, snapshots on their phone and all kinds of personal stuff, which is really beautiful. And then there's a section which has these great essays by the director, the director of the Big Apple Circus and the director of, a, of, a, of an organization in California called Circopedia. It's kind of like the Wikipedia for circus called Circopedia. Wow. It's really wonderful. It's got like videotapes and everything about circus around the world. And John Doe is like a brilliant historian about circus across the, across the globe. He's really phenomenal. So he runs that Circopedia site. So he wrote a beautiful letter about, about Rob. I mean, actually, it's quite stunning. It's quite, it, it brings tears to your eyes when you read it. Um, so, yeah, so that was my first book. And, and, and I just realized, well, I, I really enjoyed putting this book together. It really was. Really how, long did, how long did it take? I mean, so you and Robert worked on your a, section for a year. It would took the whole thing. I mean, my section was already done because I had already photographed Rob, you know, those three oh, places. So that was all done. I just had to pick out what what pictures they wanted to use. Um, and then it took me a year to put together all the other photographers and all the friends and all the essays and the quotes and Facebook comments and all that. Yeah. And, and, and the graphic designer and I kept on going back and forth with choices about like, no, change this and move that picture there and make this a vertical. And we had a lot, we had, Noah's, Noah, my graphic artist is just brilliant. Um, so he, he, he was great. And because how did he, you, how did you find Noah? Like, so Noah, Noah is a very unique individual. Noah is like a reincarnation of Groucho Marx. He actually performs Groucho Marx. Oh my and God. he's a historian also, he, he actually, it's a long story, but anyway, so Noah, I met Noah when he was performing in this wonderful play that the Marx Brothers had done in 19 whatever, and Noah resurrected this play as a musical that was that was made uh, back then on Broadway, and then he resurrected it like three or four years ago here in Manhattan. He had a cast of like 25 people all singing and doing the Marx Brothers, and he had two other people, 
You had three other people that playing out the Marx Brothers, Chico, Harpo, and Zeppo. They were all, all the brothers were all, four of the brothers were there doing their show. It was a really stunning. Anyway, so I met, I met Noah there. And then Noah said, well, I'm a graphic artist. I'm like, oh, no kidding. You do all that and you're a graphic artist too? Oh my God. So New York is great for that because people are just so, so brilliant, you know, just wonderful to meet all these brilliant people. So Noah and I got together and we started working on this book together. And uh, he did just a beautiful job on it. It was just a really stunning job on it. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. really awesome. So when when did it come out? When was it finally published? Yeah, that's uh, – my time slips by really fast. I'm not sure. I would say uh, – let me think now, 2021 now. I would say it came out like early 2020. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So kind of before the COVID – before yes, the definitely pandemic. before the COVID thing. Yes, yeah. definitely before the COVID thing. Yeah, yeah, before that. And then, and I had sent out all the books to all the people around the world. I mm -hmm. sent cop their copies with this little note and I made a cute little iconic sticker, sent it out with the, all, the, all the books to everybody. Actually, I had someone deliver one of the books to New Zealand. <laughs> so a friend of mine was performing in New Zealand. I said, oh, are you going to see so-and-so? She goes, probably. Go, Here, give him this book. <laughs> that was great. That was great. So, that is so awesome. then, yeah, so then, you know, then COVID happened, right? And then uh, I'm sitting here thinking, what am I going to do? I can't photograph anybody. I can't participate. I can't add anything to my blog, you know, new. Mm -hmm. So... Then I came up with the Board Visuals Press, a, a new publishing venture. Uh, yeah. Definitely a fun idea. I can yeah. publish anything I want. I love that idea that uh, you can publish anything you want. Um, you're the boss. So I came out with this book. It's, it was a very unique kind of silly story. So I, I like to collect vaudeville memorabilia, mm -hmm. stuff from the early days of vaudeville. And uh, I, I go to online you know, auctions and get little souvenir postcards and stuff in the early 1900s. And one of the things that I got was this cute little brochure. A little, it was a promotional pamphlet, you might say, like a 13 or 14 page pamphlet. And it was about a company that existed in the early 1920s. They came to America from, so, so the gentleman that put his, the whole thing together, his name was Ike Rose, okay, and he, he put together Hungarian, Polish, German, Australian, I mean, all from that whole area, he put together a company of 25 midgets, which we like to refer to them now as little people because yes. they don't like that term anymore. But that was yes. used back then as a, you know, as a promotional key to get people interested in seeing the show. So he had 25 little people and all of them were like playing saxophone, played piano, sang, danced. They were all extremely talented people they just happen to be what they call vertically disadvantaged. <laughs> that's, the, that's the word that people use these days. But he was he was a, quite an entrepreneur. He was like kind of like a P.T. Barnum or, 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 or Zegfeld. He was that kind of a person that put, put big shows together. And so he took these 25 people, these 25 little people, brought them to America, and they toured the vaudeville circuit from the 1923 all the way through the 50s. For 30 years, they were performing all over vaudeville in, wow. until until vaudeville ended so yeah so that was that was that's ike rose so the company was called ike rose's royal midges wait let me just interject just for a quick question um so because i don't this is not an area i mean i don't know right. a lot about this area of vaudeville but vaudeville ended in the 50s is that right or like no, actually, when did Earlier than that, but there were other, there were some theaters that were lingering. They were showing they had like movies plus live entertainment. Yeah. So it was the advent of the of film that basically ushered out that. Okay, so I was definitely. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Continue. This is yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, so uh, I wrote this Royal right. Midget, and uh, I got this little brochure, and it was like thirteen pages, and I said, "Wow, this is really wonderful." And I bet like nobody knows anything about this right now. And, and what a wonderful idea to bring it to people's attention during the COVID. So it's, a, it's kind of yeah. a funny, charming story. It's a true story, you know, and, and it, it's really, so we go on from there. I take the brochure, I contact Noah. I said, no, I want to do this little booklet. He said, okay, fine, you know. So then I, I contact another friend of mine who's a vaudeville historian. I go, can you write about this? And he goes, yeah, I've already, I've already written about these companies in my blog. So he's got a blog about vaudeville. He's already written about Ike Rose's company and all the other people. 
So I said, okay, great. I want you to be, I want you to write the text for the book, you know? And then I contacted another friend of mine, James Taylor, who was the kind of a sideshow historian. I asked him to write the, the foreword to the book, mm-hmm. you know, I knew his name was, he was, he's a great guy. He's really fun. And then I started purchasing vintage postcards online mm-hmm. from this theater company that they used to hand out as souvenirs back in the, in the 20s and so cool. 30s. Yeah, so then the book is illustrated with over 100 pictures of postcards and letters and photographs. So that's, that's the book up till then. Okay, then we're, we're moving along. It's been, it's been like, you know, three or four months now. I mentioned this to a very good friend of mine who's a, a, a clown. She, she performed in Barnum on Broadway. She's a lovely person, uh, Karen. I said, Karen, I'm working on this book project. It's about Rose's Royal Midges. And she said, my grandmother was in that company. What? <laughs> my, what? <laughs> she said, I used to wear my grandmother's clothes when I was five years old. <laughs> so she had a, her grandmother was three foot 11, performed with Rose's Royal Midges. So I said, Karen, and this is, this is synchronicity. If ever, you, I need to do an interview with you and if possible, your mother, who was a daughter. Yes of this woman, right? So I got together with Karen, did a beautiful interview with her. Then I, and I did, and then I interviewed her mother on the phone because she's out in Ohio. Um, she's 84, it was a very beautiful interview with her. It was great. And then they sent me all these personal letters, photographs, contracts, all these great personal things that tied the book together in a way that I would never have suspected it from the beginning. Oh my God. I love that. I love that kind of trail where you find, it's so interesting because some people talk about like when you write a book, you create an outline and you know the plan and you like put push forward and you fill in all the blanks and check off the boxes. But honestly, um, I find most of the time, um, things come together in ways like you, you have to kind of leave open these doorways of like, you don't actually know exactly how it's going to manifest. And then when it does, it's like, oh, op- that's exactly what was supposed to happen. But like, you know, you couldn't have written that. You couldn't have known oh, any no. of that. Like, no, I never, that. Know. never known that. I mean, that's so I mean, cool. You know, I mean, like, it's such a, it's such a remote possibility that you meet somebody that's you know, involved in something that you're writing a book about, a nonfiction book about is mind boggling. So that added a beautiful dimension to the book. That's so I wrote the preface to the book, which is all about what I just told you, finding the brochure, me, you know, talking to Karen, interviewing her mother. And then, and then from there it goes on to the, I'll show you, here it is. Here. Yeah. So here's the book right here. Okay, and the cover says, Roses, Royal Midgets and Other Little People of Vaudeville. Correct. That's the title of the book, and I love it. the uh, the the book goes wow. with all the pictures, all the ephemera. I love that. Yeah, it's great. And now, now here's the thing: when I was researching the book, I, I I discovered a lot of amazing things about photographers that I didn't know anything about that existed at the turn of the century, and one of them was Charles Eisenman, who had a studio on the Bowery during what was considered or called at the time the Gilded Age in New York, right? When uptown they were building these luxurious buildings with millions of dollars and the Rockefellers and all these people. Downtown on the Bowery, it was like the most happening place in the world. It was like dime museums and shows and all kinds of carnival. also, the Bowery was also like the home of all the, um, was it leather workers and like fit, like people coming off the wharfs possibly? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, like, it was my... for, it was for the, the working class. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was, it was entertainment. It was kind of like working class entertainment um, block. And like, yeah, because like the tenements, the original tenements are like kind of near the Bowery and you can go to the tenement museum and tour it, which is really cool. Yeah. So just kind of painting a picture for people who are not from New York City and don't know like the differences. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, then, so yeah. So the the um, the Bowery was really happening. Charles Eisenman was a photographer. So I came across his, his collection um, at a uh, library in America here. And this is a, a section that I got approval from them to do um, oh my gosh, that's a whole amazing. section. I have like 12 pictures of little people that Charles Eisenman shot in the late 1890s on the Bowery. Wow. They're, and they're beautiful. They're just ex- exquisite shots. 
That is so that's in the book. That's all these wonderful pictures of people that like pictures, and and the story is wonderful. The story is a great story, and that's that's what I that's my recent, and that that one wasn't done with uh, GoFundMe. <laughs> that was me. That was and you. It, I mean, you've got the bug now. You've got the yeah, totally. Bug. Yeah, so I'm ready great. to work I on mean, my. Second, I'm working on a second book already. Of course you are. Okay. Well, um. Okay. So circling back, let's talk about a little bit. I have questions about publishing printing. How did you, did you go through like Ingram Spark or did you go through, um, like how did you find the printer that you were going to use? Um, yeah, just some of the, like kind of the nitty gritty. Yeah, and also, so, is it yeah. really difficult to start your own publishing company? Basically, you start a company. Um, in whatever state you're in, you file for a company, bank account, certificate of business, whatever, right? And then once mm -hmm. you get your business set up, it's either an LLC or a DBA or, or, or incorporated. One of those three things you can start. A, and then, I mean, it's good to do that. You can't just really have a publishing business without having an, uh, a little bit behind you legally, uh, like a company of some sort, DBA, sure. LLC, et cetera. Anyway, so yeah, so I started Board Visuals and uh, it's a DBA. It's not a big corporation. Sure, <laughs> sure. You use that as a bank account. And uh, then I have two friends who are in publishing, two friends who are very, very friend, uh, good friends of mine who are, who are actually publishers. They have their own companies, their own businesses, one of which I met because I was being contracted by him to do a book with him. We were, we were, we were doing my book of photographs. So the 10, 10 years, the last 10 years of my photographs, we were going to do a book with him uh, at some point. So I, we got, became very, very good friends. That book never came to fruition because his company decided they didn't want to do art books anymore. Just about when we were ready to do our book, they decided they didn't want to do art books anymore. So the other, and the other one is, is um, a company called uh, Modern Vaudeville Press. And Tom is a juggler, a brilliant juggler, performs all over the world. And he has a little publishing company, which he does books about juggling and variety arts, uh, kind of like my company, but but different in mine's more eccentric. His is more mainstream uh, juggling and stuff like that. So he, both of those guys have been extremely useful um, in terms of being, giving me information about where to go, what to do, how to set up the company, how to get your book published. I did do POD, print on demand, okay. through Ingram Spark. Okay. And that was on the more recent book, on the Roses book. Yes. On the first book, uh, the, Ro uh, the Rob Torres book, I did that through Blurb. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. beautiful job. I and mean, they did a gorgeous job. But, it, you know, it, because it's a coated stock paper um, and a beautiful job, on the it, it cost some money. Yes, and that's the thing sure. that I had to solicit, solicit friends of Rob's to pay for that because I couldn't afford to pay for all this. It was 85 copies of people, 85 people signed up uh for that book that's amazing yeah that's which is so great cool. great yeah he, he, so awesome. if you go on youtube you can see videos of rob performing he is such a sweetheart i mean no matter where no matter what audience he's in front in they just they, they fall in love with him in like a minute I, so I will share all of these links in the show notes so be sure to email me okay some of this so that i can like update everything yeah yeah yeah, yeah so uh, that, that was uh that was the most recent thing was um the Royal, Roses Royal Midgets. And uh, so now, like, I'm sure you had originally planned to probably do some sort of tours or events or like the yeah, book release signing. I don't know um, if you're planning to travel to do that. And now it's like, okay, everything's changed. I mean, what yeah. what's your, do you have a strategy right now? Or are you just yeah, I'm, I'm winging it. <laughs> <laughs> we had, we had, we had plans. We had plans got blown to the wind by COVID. Um, but I'm, I'm sending out, um, I'm sending out a bunch of postcards with press releases to different uh, independent booksellers uh, to make okay. a, like an announcement that the book is out, okay. and um, <clears throat> sending out press releases, doing a lot of social media, um, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. All the things um, that you love. Every day, I mean, I hate. I know. So Jim is also. Uh, wait, wait, what was the the club that you're a part of? That uh, club recluse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> recluse. <laughs> That's my alter ego. <laughs> exactly. Me too. Me too. I, I'm yeah. like, unfortunately, um, when you're talented, you have to get out there and you have to like. Sometimes you have to toot your own horn, but. Um, but honestly, uh, I, I think you and I would both be just as happy hiding under like, you know, 
a rock somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And playing some music or listening to some music. Yes. Or, reading you know, a great book. Having yeah. a shot of rum or something relaxing. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. But these are yeah. things that you learn, right? Like you learn just like you learn to publish and, and create the company. It's like you you learn how to market. You learn that how to engage in social media without letting it like overtake your life. I mean, it's I think, or you try to learn. Yeah, I'm working yeah, that's on correct. that. I try and I try and do the least amount of work as possible to get the promotion out there. Um, I use um, a program called Hootsuite, mm-hmm. which is great to kind of send to all the different uh, social medias you can schedule them like i can do a whole week in advance yes on all the social media and then uh, on sunday i'm done for the week and it sends out everything to twitter i have three twitter accounts and one page two facebook pages three facebook pages um wow. my own board visuals and now i have board visuals press so there's three pages on facebook yes three, three different twitter accounts I used to have a radio show on Radio Free Brooklyn. Great, great guys. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I started off with the Cajun music, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had a Cajun show for, for, I don't know, like 26 weeks we did that. And then and then when uh, Debra stopped doing the festival, I said, well, wait a minute. I'm really so like De- more. <laughs> ah, that's so funny. So Debra um, used to run, she started, founded, and ran the uh, Bayou in Brooklyn festival, which was a Cajun festival that came to Brooklyn Heights uh, every year. And I think it was six or seven years running. I don't know. It was a long time. And it was a really, really popular festival, always sold out, amazing. All these performers coming up from Louisiana. And there was dancing and music and cooking and oh my gosh, all the things. She did a phenomenal job. So anyway, that's what he's talking about. Yeah, it was it was a wonderful song. And I did the radio show, which kind of like supplemented uh, the festival with listening material for people when they weren't dancing or playing music or, or attending the festival. Yes. Um, yeah, so that was, and then I and then I changed over to the jazz uh, radio show. And I did that for uh, uh, six months, seven months or something, yeah. That was really fun. I, I do love jazz, I have to say, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's great, it's great music, great music. So that's, yeah, so that's where we are now. I mean, just, um, we're, I'm working now, the new book I'm working on now is the one that I was planning on doing with, with my friend, but who decided not to do art books anymore. <laughs> so it's called, it's called um, uh, Don't Miss This, A Decade of Eccentric Performing Arts Photographs by Jim mm-hmm. And that's going to be uh, 10 years, 1999, no, uh, 2009 to 2019, uh, just before COVID. Uh, when I was photographing up until that point, you know, and 10 years of all the, all the primo photographs that I took of all these performing artists down, downtown New York. Um, really fun shots, really fun stuff. Okay. So I have a question. Have you ever thought, do you think that you will ever um, publish other authors under your press, like other vaudeville, maybe people who want to share their stories and publish? Um, is that something that you've thought about for the future? Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. That'd be really I mean, fun. Uh, we, we definitely it's open open for uh, open for open for manuscript submission. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Okay, yeah. so you performers out there, uh, juggling or or otherwise, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will share all of Jim's information. You can reach out to him. Um, I I would love. I think stories are so powerful, right? So like all the people who may have lived this life. I mean, I'm still reeling about Karen and her mother. Like, I would love to just hear the transcript of that entire conversation over the phone. Like, that is amazing. I wonder. You actually, the interview with Karen, the interview with Karen is mm-hmm. actually posted on my blog. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Her mom's not, her mom's an audio interview, but yeah. That is awesome. That is really cool. And... Yeah. What, let's see. What else can you do, Jim? Let's see. We could yeah. <laughs> start your own podcast, uh, you know, another radio show. I don't know. No, I, I think I'm just focusing. I'm trying to simplify my life and I'm oh trying to spend gosh. more time relaxing and uh, and reading. I'm reading a book about I'm reading a book about uh, elephants in northern Asia that, nice. you know, these creatures are phenomenal what they do and what they know and how smart they are. 
It's an amazing book. This uh, anthropologist went up to the uh, Thailand and that area up there and um, and and lived with these um, natives, basically, who who who, uh, who had in their possession these amazing elephants, and they would rent them out to people to do jobs, you know, like carry huge gigantic logs or pull a big tree out of the ground or something. And they, and they would and they would jump on top of the elephant and they would go over to this area and he would wrap his trunk around the pull out the tree or walk through streams of water to get to the other side with, you know, with a bunch of like a family of people that had been, you know, like uh, caught in a national disaster or something. I mean, they, they do amazing things. It's a really beautiful, really beautiful book. So I don't know how I get to that, but anyway. So. That is so cool. I love it. I love it. I And I, I think, right. So we were talking about like you actually finding time to rest. To yeah. read. To that. read, which is reading. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I feel the same way. Like I, I'm really struggling with trying to, or not struggling, but I'm trying to focus this season on being really, really thoughtful um, and intentional about simplify my life as much as possible hence this which I, to do this i've completely complicated my life like i'm selling a house i had to upgrade my vehicle i had to buy another trailer i'm having to wait for, so right now my life is not simple it's very complicated but hopefully two weeks from now my life will be very simple like the, we're really hoping for this so yeah as i'm selling my furniture and i'm doing all this but um but yeah this idea of like making more space like we all need to work we all have our passions we have our projects but then making space to do the things we love like and one of the things i love you know besides playing music in my spare time i love to read and it's hard to find time to read all the things that you want to read like it's um so that's something i've been really making a conscious effort um and i've been doing a pretty good job of of reading through i've always been a fast reader and i love lots of different topics and so i end up getting so yeah i either end up getting you know finding these books through social media or friends or you know i end up wandering into a, like a books a half price bookstore or an indie bookstore if there's one local and uh and then i get into trouble because then i end up with a stack of books and i'm like oh my gosh how am i ever gonna read all this stuff and i gotta finish writing mine and i have to yeah but it's a great problem to have you know this you know the feeling all too well <laughs> yes yes it's a, it's totally an addiction so also um, uh, last week in my podcast i was telling everyone how i am addicted to or a couple of weeks ago how i'm addicted to rv life but i'm also addicted to books so like my happy place and also one of my favorite things to do is to take a book into a bar. I'm that girl. I'm the one who will sit in the corner of the bar with a beer and drink and eat and read my book. So it's there's something about like where you're in a social setting, but you don't have to engage. I know. Like, so you feel the ambiance and you get the really great beer and you know, but you can hide and read this book. And, and that's something I just love to do. So that's great. That's, that's great. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let's, um, I am wondering what kind of uh, tips that you have for other people who are listening to this. Maybe there's some a listener who's like, you know, we're talking about this dream of writing and publishing and they're like, oh my gosh, I have all of, I have this archive of material that I've never known what to do with. Um, what are some of your, do you have any like tips on, I don't know, your process or how to encourage people to that you know to share their story to do this it's a lot of work but i think yeah. it's really worth it yeah I, I think it's worth it i mean uh, i think that uh, we all relish reading about other people's lives and and if someone has an interesting story to tell then by all means share it and uh if it means taking a class in a local community college and how to write a book then that's what you got to do you know I, I in fact last night i watched a wonderful uh, one of the one of the classes that I was telling you about was a, a historical nonfiction class. There was a woman writer, uh, uh, was quite successful actually, uh, Jane uh, Jane Jane Allison. Her name is. She wrote uh, something called the Love Artist, which is a beautiful story about Ovid in in the Roman Roman times back in Caesar's day. But it's a historical novel, so a historical nonfiction. So it's basically her interpretation of Ovid's life back then. Anyways, she was in a classroom with a bunch of students uh, in this seminar last night that I watched. And she was talking about how valuable she thinks 
writing is uh, to humanity. I mean, because she's a writer and she, she gets, uh, embellishes the idea of writing and reading and, uh, and, uh, and how much she, she encourages everybody to spend time reading. And if they can write, you know, write their story, tell the story, get it out there, you know. It's a craft, but it's certainly something that people can learn. You know. And it's also, it's a, it's a muscle that you flex over time, right? You get better. The more you read, the more you write, the better you get. I mean, it's just one of those things. It's like, um, it, that's, that's really beautiful because I do think, especially we've seen that in this like crazy quarantine, crazy, you know, tumultuous politically and otherwise time that we've just gone through and, uh, we'll probably, you know, there'll be more of that in the future, I'm sure. But, um, but the thing is, is that we've seen so many people pull back and go into either nature, go into reading, um, baking. Book sales, huh? Baking, baking. Yes, yes. <laughs> and and like I know, book sales have gone up. Like publishers are busy. Like it, this is a really great time. It's not a great time for marketing and tours, but it's really, mm -hmm. it's a really um, fertile time because a lot of people were forced to stay home and like we all need to express ourselves somehow and putting your words on a page and putting that out there that is one of the those forms of expression that that's how we connect to other people yeah i think it, it's important to, to persevere on your ideas if you have an idea just uh find a way to express it get it out there um or find okay. someone who's going to who's going to collaborate with you, right? Like right. maybe maybe you don't have all of the skills or all of the this or that. You can find someone who also is passionate about that subject and and Absolutely. collaborate. Which yeah, I mean, I hired I hired Noah to do the graphic arts on both the books that I did with him. You know, uh, he didn't have as much interest in midgets as I did, so I had to pay him to do the, the layout on the book. <laughs> but he did, beautiful, he did a beautiful job on it. And he eventually came around to understanding the, the you know, curiosity and novelty and the, the loveliness of those people, you know. Um, yeah, so uh, actually, the, the, um, this is the most recent version of the book, which is the, the hardcover cover version. I only had the paperback black and white available, but now we just came up with this one. Which is, which is, you see, uh, I don't know if you can see this. It, it's color. Yes, yes. Color, color and hardcover. So it's really oh, a beautiful that. little edition. Um, that's going to be a limited edition. I'm only going to print 50 of those and, and, you know, number them and sell them. Um, so people can find that if they reach out to you. Yeah, if they go to visuals.com and then there's a tab to shop, it's right on that on that tab okay get there. your copy be the one be one of 50 in the world yeah you have that it's that's be, amazing that would be a great gift for someone it's a beautiful I mean, book yeah a friend of mine really bought beautiful. 10 copies of my book think about it christmas time this past year yes yeah yeah that's why i'm hoping to have mine published early enough so that i can uh, really uh, spread it around for christmas gifts have it as as a stocking stuffer or whatever you know so, How are you going to publish your book? I'm not sure yet. So right now I'm in the process. Um, an, an editor in New York uh, is Megan McKeever is editing it right now. And um, I am going to get that back by the end of this month. And we'll have all my structural line edits to revise and or, you know, deal with. And then um, and then at that point, I've been debating whether to self-publish through Ingram. I really like Ingram Spark. Or um, try to do like a co-publishing with Kohler Books or some some other publishing company. So, oh. um, yeah. So I'm kind of weighing it out. I know I'm I'm expecting to put a lot of my own money up front um, into it because I'm also really planning a big, huge marketing uh, push. Um, that's where the money. That's where the money goes. Not yeah. so much in publishing the book, but in the marketing of the book. Yes. And, you know, part of that is it's a, it's a love story set on the Texas wine trail. So, you know, this just means I have to go travel around to wineries and like, Oh my goodness, that's going to be terrible. I know it's horrible. <laughs> I mean, I can't, why did I do that? <laughs> there's a plan there. There's a plan. Jim. Yeah. I think there's definitely a subconscious plan there. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Books and wine. I mean, what could be, yeah. Could be worse. Could be worse. <laughs> yeah, could be worse. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, I'm excited. I mean, I feel like right now, um, 
yeah, I need to start getting back into research, but I've you know got my plate a little bit full with life transitions. Yeah. Uh, um, and then I'll start to dig back into researching, publishing, and figuring out, um, yeah, the next steps after. Because, of course, I'm going to plan to take some time off work so I can really get my revisions done quickly because I want to uh, want to get it out there, you definitely, know? Definitely take a, a little time off and uh, spend it focusing on getting that thing finished. You know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I miss my characters. I miss like when, you know, I don't know if it's the same for nonfiction. Maybe it is. Uh, but for fiction, it's like every day for three months, I was like hanging out with these characters and I was like, ex you know, writing it as things are happening and like having these experiences. And I just, I loved seeing them develop. I loved the backstories. I loved the nuance and I, I really miss. That's exactly what Jane Allison was talking about. Listen, I'm, I'm going to send you the link to that. Do. that you would really yeah. love it because she's, her book is phenomenal. I mean, she's written quite a few books now, about nine books, but, but she's a very popular author and uh, brilliant. I mean, all about women's rights, and, you know, she's great. Um, yeah, so the, her talking last night, listening to her talk about her work and, you know, how she thinks that literature affects people, and, uh, you know, it, it was just, it was inspiring, totally inspiring, you know? That's, yeah, yeah, and I, I think with this, so my book is part of a series, and yeah, I think right. the, the thing I wanted to do, I wanted to write the book that I want to read, which I hear that a lot from authors, um, is, you know, I wanted to read a love story, but I didn't want her to be saved. I wanted her to save herself. Like I, I wanted it to be sexy for her to be authentic and for the characters to be authentic and have agency. Um, but at the same time, it still be really, really exciting and fun to read. And, and there's still, you know, the plot twists and there's still you know there it's still exciting it's just that i was just tired of always the girl always getting you know just the same templates which is fine i i mean i love those templates i read them i watch them it's fine but i wanted something a little bit more close to home and also a heroine who's in her 40s hmm. who's find, finding love the second time around like that that's something that really i wanted to inspire and give hope to people that like um so many of these love stories and things happen when you for the twenties or, you know, the younger, but you know, we still love and we get older. So I wanted to write something. <laughs> yeah, love is, love is ageless. There's no time frame on that. That's love, right? right. That's yeah. right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, if you don't like the love story, you'll, you'll learn about wine and drink wine. I mean, like, you know, it's like, whatever. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Can't but, do that. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, oh my gosh, it's been so much fun talking to you. And I'm going to share all the links to your books, um, to your blog, um, ways to reach you, uh, listeners. If you, uh, you know, have any questions or something that Jim has talked about or we've talked about in this episode that's like piquing your curiosity, reach out to him. Um, I'll give you all that, those ways to contact him. And, um, and yeah, who knows what will, what will come out of this. So, never know. Never know. You know we we don't know. We just have to go forward. I like the fact that your, your bookcase is so bright. Mine is very dark. <laughs> yeah, this is my light is really bright too. I realize I'm like <laughs> I look like yeah. I'm in the day and you're in the the dark. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the cave. I'm in the man cave over here. <laughs> you're in the stacks. You're like you know yeah. in the New York Public Library stacks somewhere yeah, yeah. <laughs> hidden away. <laughs> oh jim well thank you so much i mean this work is um first of all it's beautiful and i um p.s i want to copy both books but um but also like i think that what you're doing is archiving a piece of history that not everyone has access to and it's and literally it's a legacy because this is something that will be available for generations to come and that's the thing about writing that's what i love about it it is something that is so powerful and um someone you know centuries from now is going to find your book and be like oh my gosh this is so amazing look at these postcards look at this the, this ephemera look at these photos one of the promo pieces that i'm sending out is this postcard oh that is great that's one of eisenman's photographs from the Bowery. it's basically just the promotion promotion postcard for the book you know that it's, is so it's one cool. of the pictures from the book, which is really nice. So for listeners who aren't watching this on YouTube, it's a picture of a man and woman standing um, on either side of a round 
kind of t- or a, a table with a cloth over it with a little person standing on it and you, so you get this like size reference you see um yeah it's it's a, it's a very beautiful shot yeah yeah it's a really beautiful series of photographs and it, at the end of the book just i was very moved by it. i contacted the uh, the organization is a um, university library that owns the rights to all of Eisenman's photographs, and they, you know they were they gave me permission to use it in the book, which is really a blessing. I, I'm so happy to be able to include that in the book because he was like the Richard Avedon of the Bowery in the 1890s. <laughs> nice, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that is um, yeah. photographing all those uh, P.T. Barnum sideshow freaks, you know. Yeah, it's making wild. me want to go dig back into when I was in at CUNY. Um, I did a research paper on fairies in New York City, and I got to dig through all the stacks and like look through all the ephemera of like the the old stubs and and all the pictures and all the fairy routes and the maps and like all the different things. Um, there used to be all this subsidized fairy service, which is now making a comeback. Um, thankfully, uh, but, but I just remember like that process is it, there's something so magical about digging through research and seeing those images and finding that stuff and putting it together and then writing words to go with it. And yeah, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, it was a fun project. I was telling someone the other day that I really enjoyed, uh, assembling the book and getting all the aspects from the different people and all the photographs and the postcards and interviewing Karen. And then when the book was done and out, then I was like, I don't, I don't want to market it. I'm not, I'm not interested in marketing. It's not my thing. I want to do another book. Yes. <laughs> needless to say, uh, I, I'm doing it. I'm putting it out there. You well, know? and who knows? Maybe you'll find an intern or someone who's really interested and wants to, um, you know, take up the marketing slack so you can focus on, on yeah. just the publishing side. So. I, I, doubt it. I doubt it because I don't see anybody. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I just hire my alter ego to do all the marketing work. That's all. That's it. That's it. (laughs) Well, Jim, it was so great talking to you. Thank you so much for being on the show and, um, and obviously give, you know, my best, my love to Deborah. Um, and, uh, we'll be talking very soon. Hopefully we'll be seeing each other, uh, not in New York somewhere, maybe North Carolina again, maybe Florida, who knows? So yeah, we'll meet up. Sounds great. Thank you very much. I enjoyed speaking with you on your show and good luck with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Flipping Dreams. Please be sure to follow us on all of our social media at Flipping Dreams or at Heather Renee May. And please check out our website and sign up for our email list where you will get notifications on our weekly podcast and blog posts, as well as our monthly newsletter, and much more. Be the first to know, sign up today. Thank you again, and we will see you next week here on Flipping Dreams.